So, hello. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the Uni Community Hours. Uh, this is the edition of September. Uh, my name is Raul Osuna, and I am release engineer for Uyuni. Uh, today, uh, the agenda will be, uh, there will be a small first point about the organization of these community hours. Then uh, I'll be talking about uh, the new release of Uyuni, what's new and what's coming. Um, then uh, we'll give a reminder about the containerized Uyuni and the release strategy. And then later on, we will be starting with the uh, sessions from the guests. And I am very happy to have the Google Summer of Code 2024 projects update from the students. Uh, actually, in the last edition, they were already talking. So it will be Rachel about uh, the refresh of the uni website and improving the access accessibility and responsiveness. And Harun about developing a lazy reposing service. And last but not least, uh, as either Cedric, Michele, or Andre will make a short announcement about the migration prepare command. And last but not least, uh, I wanted to uh, have a small Q&A about the migration of unit to containers. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, about the organization, um, I sent a poll in GitHub discussions uh, because the meeting is uh, the last uh, Friday of the month. And I had the impression that sometimes uh, it could be in a little bit inconvenient. Uh, well, I sent a, a few points of the, the reason of um, why this could be. And uh, so far, the poll is, uh, it looks like it's getting positive feedback. And the suggestion would be to move it to uh, Thursdays, uh, still keeping the same um, time so that at least the people in the east coast of uh, the us and uh, maybe some parts of south america uh, can join as well if uh, desired but also keeping uh, um, the schedule for the um, most of the developers that are uh, located here in in europe so please if you haven't done so uh, send your uh, vote in the github discussion I, you have the link here and, and if not, it is easy to find in, in the discussions. Is there anyone from the community who would like to say anything about this? Or uh, maybe you prefer to take your time and discuss it offline. But if not, happy to hear you. OK, it doesn't look like. So Uyuni, what's new and what's coming? Uh, so first of all, Please remember that uh, the next release of Uyuni that is going to, to be released um, is going to be containers only. Uh, so if you haven't done so, uh, please plan the migration accordingly. Uh, we'll talk further about that later on. But so far, there you go, the documentation about this. And about the next release, uh, the most important points will be uh, the possibility to configure app strings via activation keys and there will be a migration prepare command that uh, the developers will tell us a little bit more about it later on and also another change is that the transaction transactional update timer uh, it has been disabled during the onboarding for transactional system uh, such as uh, lib micro because uh, there were this led to undesired reboots and it was a bit confusing so this was simply disabled when when you onboard such of the uh, one of uh, system any quest ah and before i forget uh, ubuntu 2404 yes uh, it is going to come in in uni um, and there is a, actually a PR from the community from very long ago, and uh, we are very thankful to have received that from the from the community. Okay, so now about the containerized uni release strategy. This uh, slide might ring a bell to you already. Uh, it's the same one updated with the releases that we have already released, like 07 and 08, and the next one, 09. Uh, well, you'll be guessing that it's almost the end of the month and it is not released yet. So 
it could be that it is called differently, but uh, whatever it is, the next release is not going to be released as a cl classical RPM version. Uh, it's going to have a, a version a bump to lib 15.6 and um, is going to um, have a PostgreSQL 16. So nothing else to tell about this unless we have, yes, Cedric? Yeah, Raul, when you say the bu a bump to lib 15.6, is it for the host or for the containers or both? And actually, the host, if I am not uh, mistaken, is uh, on Lib Micro. Uh, Marina, can you confirm? Yeah, so we are going uh, to, to build the containers uh, on uh, uh, Lib 15.6, but uh, as usual, uh, you can uh, go in then to install uh, um, Uyoni on uh, Lib, uh, Lib Micro. So the Lib 15.6 is referred. Uh, to the system we are using for, uh, to the OS we are using for building the containers. Okay, uh, and just I just wanted to highlight that, so we're running the container on Lib Micro, but feel free to test it on any recent con um, container host, be it um, Alba Linux or Ubuntu Debian. Okay. Is there a so, minimum Podman version that we recommend? Uh, I think we require 5.4 or something. Uh, uh, 4.5, uh, maybe. Yeah, 4.5, <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> I'm confusing the numbers. OK. So thanks a lot for the clarifications and for the questions. Okay, and now I'm happy to switch to the Google Summer of Code projects. Uh, and the first one was uh, refresh the uni website and improve accessibility and responsiveness from Rachel. So Rachel, if you are ready to present. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, Rahul, can you hear me? I can yes. hear you. Uh, if you can share your okay. screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? It's starting, yes, we can see it. So maybe you can put the slideshow. Okay, what about now? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Aditayo. I'm a Google Summer of Code contributor, and I'm working on refreshing the UMI website and improving its accessibility. So in this presentation, I'll be providing a brief updates on the project and the progress we've made so far. So at the beginning of the project, the first thing we did was to analyze the website using the wave accessibility tool. So this tool helps us identify and categorize the accessibility issues into key groups. As you can see on the left part of this image. So it groups the errors into these categories, the errors, contrast errors, alerts, features, structural elements, and area. So grouping it this way allowed us to prioritize the most critical errors that was affecting the website. So once we identified the accessibility errors, then we created issues on GitHub where we outlined the proposed solution. So this also made it easier for us to track our progress and also keep our work organized as we're addressing the accessibility issues on the website. So where issues were identified? So these are some of the issues um, that was identified by WAVE. First one was low comp. Um, low contrast color issues on all of the web pages. And also missing alternative text for some images and icons. Screen reader compatibility error. Some of the important information on the website was not visible to a screen reader and they were not being read out. 
and this affects people that use screen readers on the website. And also, the website was not responsive on smaller screen on, on mobile devices. So these are just some of the accessibility issues identified by WAVE. So, so far, we've already resolved several accessibility errors on the website, and we implemented a simple and straightforward solution so that it will be easier for other developers to maintain the code and also contribute to it. <clears throat> so this is um, a before and after comparison of some of the changes we've made. In this first image on the left, WAVE identified um, a low color contrast between this text here and the background color. So it makes the text difficult to read. So to fix this, we used a deeper background color that was still similar to Uyuni brand colors and the low co color contrast error was resolved. This is another example of the same low color contrast errors because the, this error was common in all of the web pages of, of the website. So we followed the same approach in fixing them. So we also use a deeper color shade for the text. Um, the color was still similar to the original color. And yeah, as you can see, we no longer flags this as an error anymore. So this is also another error that was addressed for mobile devices. Here yeah, you can see the elements overlaps each other and doesn't make the website accessible. So to fix this, we make sure only the important elements are displayed on mobile devices and the less important ones were hidden. So this category also, the, the text in the boxes were not fully displayed. So but for now, we, we implemented this to make the text display fully on mobile devices. So also some of these improvements have not really been merged into the main code for now because we're still testing it across several devices. So this is the current status of the websites. Previously, we've identified um, 13 critical errors and 30 contrast error for all of the web pages of the website. But now we've been able to fix all these errors. So what's left to do? We still have a lot of improvements to implement. Since this project was a small sized project, and the timeline was eight weeks. We couldn't really resolve all the issues within that time frame. However, even though the Google Summer of Code program for this year has ended, we plan to continue working on these improvements. And that's one of the goals of Google Summer of Code. The program encourages contributors to keep contributing to open source projects, even beyond the duration of the program. So our plan is to continue working on these projects until all the improvements have been implemented. So that, that's the update for now. And if you come across any issues while using the websites, you can report it by creating an issue on our GitHub page. And if you have any question, we'll be happy to answer it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Rachel. And yes, as she said, uh, you see that uh, there are a lot of things that can be done to contribute. And it's always it's not always about uh, the product itself. So you see this time uh, about the code of the product, it was about the website. So thanks a lot for your contribution, Rachel. I'm going to share my screen again. And next uh, is going to be Harun, the other Google Summer of Code student with his project project to develop a lazy repositing service. So Harun, are you ready? Yes. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen real quick. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. It's loading. It looks like yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Harun Hassan. I'm an engineering student from Tunisia and I've been a Google Summer of Code mentee during the 2024 summer uh, within the OpenSUSE project uh, under the Uni project, developing a project named uh, 
developing a lazy reposting service. So let's uh, jump into a quick reminder of uh, the lazy reposting idea and uh, the issues or the problematic from which we got to think about the lazy reposting. Uh, okay, so currently uh, Uni uses a tool called reposync, which is responsible for synchronizing the packages uh, for both RPM and Debian. And the current approach is actually downloading all the connecting to the repositories and downloading all the packages from that repository. And we we say all the packages, we mean the metadata and also the binaries and the actual packages and save the packages in the file system and the metadata in the database. And the problem with this approach is that uh, downloading all the packages might be very time consuming and very resource and very costing in terms of resource because some repositories might contain thousands of packages uh, or hundreds of thousands of packages actually and this might take a lot of time and the the client actually might not mm, very likely to use all these packages uh, immediately after the download he might use he might use few of them and it's very rare to for the client to use all of them. So there is a lot of waste of time and resources that we can uh, postpone the download of some packages into another um, another time. So the idea is that developing uh, the idea of the lazy reposing actually is separating the work the reposing workflow into two different workflows. As we just as we said in the previous Unity community hours. And uh, so the first workflow would be uh, synchronizing the metadata of the packages from the repository. So only the metadata will be synchronized at the first step and no packages will be downloaded. And after these metadata has been synchronized, it can be delivered to the client and the client can see the packages, metadata and the information. And the client um, might not necessarily be aware that some of the packages are downloaded or not for him all the packages are ready to use. And the other, the other workflow will be the downloader. So we can execute the laser reposing downloader separately um, in another step. And the download will be based on some defined strategies that we define um, based on uh, some kind of priority of packages because some packages might be, might have higher priority or more likely to, you, to be used other than other packages. So we can take these uh, these uh, conditions or uh, metrics into consideration when defining the strategies of the download. So what we have here that we separated the reposing workflow into two different workflows that can run independently from each other. And they, and, uh, they can actually be multiple instances of the uh, metadata synchronizer and multiple instances instances of the download and this this might be very useful in uh, scaling so as we just said the uh, the key feature of the laser reposing is to run the uh, metadata synchronization uh, independently and then download the packages in another step or uh, another service Okay, so what we've done during the Google Summer of Code is that we implemented the uh, download or the metadata synchronization for both RPM and Debian. And for RPM, the synchronization process is can be summarized in these uh, three steps. First, we download the metadata files from the remote repositories, which are mainly the primary XML, the file list XML, the update info, using uh, streams to not download everything at once for performance reasons. Uh, we parse these XML files uh, using DOM tree, which is not actually very efficient with large files, and also pull down parsers, which is a combination between uh, between DOM tree and SAX parsers, which is uh, a lazy, lazy loading or lazy parser, which uh, doesn't actually uh, load everything into memory at once. It parses incrementally. And of course, we're using Python generators to uh, to handle the uh, parsed packages in chunks and yield these parsed packages. And uh, we, after we uh, completed the parsing and put the metadata in the, right inf in the right format, we imported this metadata into the database using the currently existing space walls 
import lib. So the import lib contains a lot of functions and tools to uh, uh, query the database, save uh, the data, for that, which is actually uh, currently used by the repossing and it's very powerful. So we should, we didn't uh, have to implement everything from scratch. So we understood, understood the, uh, the behavior of the import lib and the data format that accepts it and we adapted it to use it. And this saved us a lot of time. So this is actually a sample execution of the lazy repo sync. It's a working uh, sample. So we can uh, file the lazy repo sync servers either by specifying the channel, which we uh, previously created and associated with the repository in the repository URL. We can specify if we want to uh, synchronize the Rattom, which is actually the um, the uh, patches, the patches or the updates. Or we can uh, fire the or execute the lazy repository providing the URL of the repositories and the type. So this, when providing the URL, is not going to be linked to any channel, only the metadata will be stored in the database. And the important note is that we're not going to be executing the lazy repository here uh, in, in the Uni server or in, it's going to be actually executed in its own container, and uh, this will help us scaling in the future. Okay, sorry. For the Debian metadata, it's going to be pretty much the same workflow instead of the instead, except that the packages are not the same. So we have packages file, which is a text file, and the translation file, which contains the uh, expanded description for each package. So uh, yeah, we parse them using using lazy loading techniques also, and importing them using also spacewalks import lib. This is actually another uh, execution example for this uh, for the Debian uh, packages or repositories. Okay, so our future work will be to complete the working on the download part. There is an ongoing discussion about the different strategies uh, that we want to work on. Uh, to implement the download part. And uh, yeah, so that will be our next uh, objective. Another objective is to containerize the lazy repossing servers. So we can run uh, multiple instances at the same time. And these inst instances can run independently uh, from each other. So we can have multiple instances of the lazy repossing that does the metadata synchronization and also multiple instances that uh, that does the that do the download of the packages and this is actually very important in terms of scalability and uh, yeah that's it and if you have any questions i'll be very happy to answer okay any question It doesn't look like, and I saw a lot of uh, positive reactions. Thanks a lot for all this work and the cost and the contributions. Thank so you I'm going very to, much. I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, and now uh, we are going to talk about the migration prepare command. Uh, it's not going to be a long talk; it's more than an announcement. Uh, Cedric, is it going to be you talking? Uh, I'll do it. Yes, but uh, I don't need any slide. I mean, uh, okay, <laughs> you, just... <laughs> you can go ahead. Um, so. For those who already tried to migrate from RPM based server to container server, you found out the MGRIDM migration, migrate Padman command. And this requires to stop the, the server for a long time during the, the complete time that, where it synchronizes all the data. And obviously, if you have a lot of repositories, it takes a lot of time. So we added a minus minus prepare parameter in this migration uh, command so that you can run the migration once with this and with this parameter. It will only do the rsync, so you just need to, um, you, you, do, you do not need to stop the server. And um, once the rsync is done, you can run it again without the minus minus prepare command. And there it will 
finished uh, complete the uh, the rsync to just get what you didn't have and finish the migration so that re helps reducing the um the time you need uh, the time where where the uh, the source server is shut down during the migration in my yes. test of this yesterday um the rsync part took somewhere around an hour uh and once i was done with that and of course this manager or i mean the uini server is not down while this is going on and then i ran it without the minus minus prepare and it took less than five minutes so if we're reducing the downtime with this that much i i think it will be fantastic actually well, the, the downtime that is reduced it really depends on on the, the size of the uh, of of the data you need to to synchronize. One hour may not be super small, but yeah, we probably can can find bigger ones. Oh, for sure, yes. So that was it. Um, so if you have a big data, a, a big database, a big instance to migrate, just wait for the, the upcoming Uni uh, release. That would be a, quite a quite a bummer to not have this minus pre, minus minus prepare uh, parameter. Okay. And this is really it. <laughs> Thank you, Cedric, and indeed very useful. I, I remember this uh, similar command from the enterprise product as well. So let's continue. And okay, related to this, uh, I wanted to yes give the community um, an opportunity to talk about the migration to containers in case somebody is about to do it and have some Q&A. So first of all, I already shared the, the URL, but uh, probably you won't remember the full uh, the full URL. So if you simply go to uh, the Unidocs and you, you browse to installation and upgrade guide, upgrade and migration server, migrate from legacy to container, there is the guide for the migration and uh, something important to mention maybe if, if somebody is not familiar with this is that it, it is not an in-place migration so uh, you need a new machine a new machine to to install uh, well to my to make the migration too and actually uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages but one advantage is that if something goes wrong uh, you just have to restore DNS, uh, DHCP, and and turn on the old machine, and and you're back to where you were. So at least this is something positive. But anyway, I wanted to hear you uh, from the community if you have any question about the migration, or or maybe somebody already migrated, or uh, do you have anything to share? I just want to share that uh, don't try to migrate to the Kubernetes version yet. There are some uh, important issues that are being um, worked on. Okay, thanks for Kubernetes that. Kubernetes is okay for for the proxy, right? Just not the server. Well, Kubernetes, you have you have Kubernetes. Um, you can run the, the also the server in Kubernetes. Um, technically, it works, but there are still some bugs. <laughs> so, Christian. Yes. So I I did the very first migration just recently, a couple of days ago. So it was a lab environment, not a customer system, but that worked pretty fine for me. And I also did a fresh Uni installation on the container-based method for a customer. And that also worked pretty fine. It was pretty easy to set up. The only thing I stumbled upon was that in case you have customers who don't have DHCP but static IP configurations, uh, well, you need to fiddle around with those NMCLI commands because by default, the TUI isn't installed and the installation doesn't prompt you for the IP address or uh, routes and so on. 
So that was the only bummer, but that was fixed after five minutes of searching the manual pages. So thanks a lot. Worked pretty pretty fine, and I really like the um, uh, migrate prepare comment because having big installations with hundreds of gigabytes of packages that will be a great thing to have the prepare comment. Okay, and thanks to you for the feedback. This is very useful, and somebody who to, who hears this and is postponing the migration indefinitely, maybe they are. Uh, <laughs> more encouraged to migrate because remember you, um, it is not an enterprise uh, product but uh, the support for um, uh, RPM version uh, is uh, disappearing so thanks for this totally worth it thanks <laughs> okay and now any general uh, question about anything that uh, we were talking about uh, this whole session well i'd like okay. to ask a bit more about uh christian's point about ip fixed ip addresses is there anything you we, we could improve that could be improved in the tools to solve this problem I think that's more an issue with the open source leap micro that's underlying because it simply thinks, okay, uh, I'm I'm polling for an IP and if I don't get an answer, well, then I have no network. So I think the last step in the installer sounds a bit like that it's going to prompt you for the information which is not taking place. So I think that's something we should maybe address to the leap micro project, I think. So mm -hmm. nothing from the um, OUNI project because you are shipping a tool that installs the container and, and all that stuff. And I don't see that there's a need that you also do the networking that should okay. be done by the underlying operating system. But maybe we can add this somewhere in the documentation. Yeah, that's what I was just going to suggest uh, that we create some guidance on documentation. Yeah, we also have another idea what should be covered in the documentation. So I, I have a customer that's that wants to go for SUSE Manager 5.0 on IBM Power, of course, because he's a, he's a power customer all, all that years. And um, he asked me, well, how do we install that thing on, on Power? And I was like, I don't know. So there's a QCOW image. But the documentation isn't very clear about this. And, and so we asked the uh, support that said, OK, that's basically a KVM image. So you need to spin up in SLES instance, running KVM, and then run the image on it. Um, and the, but the customer didn't want to go for another layer in his setup. And he, um, yeah. he, he, was, he was tinkering around. And, and he found out that it's also possible to uh, simply deploy that QCAL image on a native disk. And if you have two disks, then the setup with um, combustion, I think the utility is called, um, is, is also working. And we want to document this and send a PR to the documentation team for this. So, <clears throat> so I just have a brief uh, response there. So we designed for all the platforms, we should have a raw image and the initial design for power is the same that you can use on arm and other other environments where you boot to a temporary environment like wow. a, 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 an iso for leap or something like that and then vd the raw image onto the storage that you have designed to be the boot device and then uh, once you're done with that temporary environment, then you can boot from that once DD has happened. The raw image is designed to expand to use the size of whatever you are copying it to. Um, and that's actually the, the design. I will admit that it is severely under-documented. And, uh, <laughs> but that's, Hopefully, going forward, that will also that will actually work on uh, all of our architectures, but it's required on power because we just don't have the ISOs. So, one question regarding that: um, So, I saw 
with three micro 6.1 there's a public beta right now power isn't supported platform but through the manager of have to dose based on sleep micro 5.5 where power isn't on supported platform so what kind of operating system is running on, on there well and i know this is uh this is a new uni call uh, and and really this is a susan manager question but um we got special dispensation from the SLE micro people to have a supported SUSE manager instance based on SLE micro 5.5. So the truth is that the bits have always been there. We just don't expose them to customers. So they actually get built in our build service but we hadn't made it supported because there wasn't a strong case for business, uh, a strong business case for a supported release of it. This actually happened also with SUSE Manager on power back in the early days, because before it was actually a supported thing, we were building it internally, and, uh, and then it migrated to become a supported offering so uh this is going to be similar with sli micro so the only context in which sli micro 5.5 is supported is in the SUSE manager images mm -hmm. and then uh for 6.1 uh support for power as a platform will officially be in the sli micro product awesome hope that answers your questions Definitely. Thanks a lot for sharing the details. Okay, and I see in the chat some more feedback on about clean installs uh, with everything going well, except a known issue with Red Hat Reposings being broken because of lib module MD defect. Okay. And Christian just uh, shared a workaround for this. And Ricardo said that uh, it should be fixed. Okay. Any other question? Any other thing to discuss? So the fix is going to be in 2024.09. I'm not sure. I'm trying to look for the issue <laughs> to confirm. No, it's not fixed yet. Um, John is still working on it. It's it's more complex than we originally thought. So still going on. Okay. So anything else? Any last minute comment? I just want to highlight that uh, um, will be two people representing Uyuni at the Google Mentor Summit this year. So I'll be I'll be going there with Marina next week, uh, not this weekend, but the one after. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I have a proposal for uh, Uyuni's journey to containers at Open Libre Free Conference in Columbus, Ohio, in November. Maybe we could add uh, all those events uh, to the uh, calendar. So in particular, if there is uh, any kind of uh, online uh, uh, way to, to join also for others. Yeah, or promote it on social media or both, yeah. Yeah, and I I just been, I have just been notified. I, I have the talk presenting a uni at Open Source Experience in Paris uh, this December. And Sally is cool. not recorded. Okay. Yes. And as we mentioned, now we have a, a calendar uh, to track such events. So we'll try to, to have it updated. Cool. So anything else? Uh, I have a new project started that might be interesting for this community. So I've been participating in a hackathon this week, and I thought it would be great to have a Terraform provider for Uyuni because I saw that you guys did some early Golang work. I saw that you have this MGR RDM tools and so on, and there's a very limited library. So this is what we did, and we have a very, very first partially working um, 
kind of code. I just put the link in the um, chat. And if you want to see it in, in action, it only takes two minutes. I can show it very quickly if you want to. Yes. <laughs> OK. Yes. So, Go ahead. so let me share my screen. Um, it could be this one. So you should now see. Should try again. Okay, I get an error message, so it doesn't seem to work. I I think you don't see any kind of share. No, I I can try to share and uh, the GitHub link that you just gave if you want let me check whether i can share my vs code with you okay that's also not not working okay yeah so if you want to you, you can share the uh, screen and i can put another link with screenshots uh, that show that this actually works and i'm not telling any any crazy things so that's another link Okay, let me share. So this is the GitHub repository. Yes, um, exactly. So it's not much, but it's honest work. And what we did is that we implemented a very first resource that can be used in order to create users within Uyuni. So that was the minimal viable product. Find out how the API works and how to use it in, in Golang. And what you can see in the second link that I put in the chat, then we, you can see screenshots of Terraform that actually creates a user. Oh, that's a GitHub. So there, there must be a um, house okay. for social. Mm -hmm. That looks great. So if you click one of the pictures, then you can see that's the output of Terraform that's going to create a user with first name, last name, login, and password, and so on. And the next screenshot, if you put the right arrow on your keyboard, then we can see that it's actually created within Uyuni. And of course, we can also destroy it once again. And then the user is removed from Uyuni, which is the third picture. And the... so that actually works. And we are pretty satisfied with it because I didn't know any Golang three days ago. And, and, I, and I thought, wow, that's a very hard language. I'm never going to master it. And three days later, we have a very minimal provider. So maybe in the future we will see more and maybe some of you want to contribute so we are open for prs and, and, and mrs we are interested in hearing your thoughts on it so maybe you want to join that's why i thought i will share this with you uh christian i'm currently uh, uh refactoring quite a bit of the um mjr dm code to at least the community side to allow writing an operator la later for, for mm -hmm. Kubernetes. Great. So uh, I'll try to have a look at your code and, and see what parts you're using in, in our code to try to, to get to, uh, to a library that we could share together. That would be awesome because I was using the MGR CTL shared folder from your GitHub repository and there uh, is the API shared dot, dot go. And this is what, I, what I'm uh, using. And and I saw that the um, the release tag on GitHub is quite outdated, so it points to zero zero one. Oh and, yeah, it's just forget. Yeah. We're not using them anymore. <laughs> yeah, so I'm so I'm ref referring to the main branch. So I think this will break in a couple of weeks when you do updates. So maybe it would be great to have a dedicated repository within the Uni organization where you have just the shared library with Golang bindings, and then other projects like this provider can simply use it, and also the CTL tools that you um, build up in the community. Okay, so you're just using the CTL tools to to um, to call the API. You're not deploying Uyuni from from your provider. No, no, it's just creating a user because I want to show ah, that it's okay. uh, that's actually working. I can put the link of the file that we are referring to. It's um, it's just the um, Uyuni tools repository main shared API go. I will put the link in yeah. the in the chat. So that's basically the file that we include in in our code, and that's 
yeah, it uses the library that you wrote for the API handling and doing the API calls. So okay. it would be great to have a shared library that does things like get users, add user, remove user, so that people don't need to manually um, make up the API calls and the result handling. Okay. So it's a different thing. I'm touching the ADM part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thanks a lot for sharing this, Christian. And I think there was some follow-up uh, uh, about these um, clean installations of uh, 2408 uh, back. And actually, Abit said uh, that something was already merged. Uh, yeah, it was uh, merged a day before yesterday, Raul. I don't think it, it made 24 or 9, but that's something that I'm checking with Marina. Okay. If it's merged, uh, it will be. Okay. Yeah, cool. that, that was my, my thought that whatever it is merged in, in master, it is going to be in the next release of Unity. Cool, cool. Okay. Any other last minute comment? Okay. It doesn't look like, and we are on the top of the hour so thanks a lot for attending thanks a lot for your patience sorry for the inconvenience and uh, needing to switch meetings and uh, hopefully uh, see you in the next edition in the end of october thanks a lot happy hacking and enjoy your weekend bye 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 bye, bye.